All right, Larry, do you see the correct screen? I do. Excellent. Well, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for coming to learn a little bit about Northern Sawwood Owls. Um, we're here to discuss Northern Sawwood Owls, and we're first going to be beginning with their life history. Then we'll move on to a bit of the banding techniques that we do here in Shasta County. And then we'll be closing with the results from Shasta County's first monitoring uh, year this past fall, 2022. First, I'd like to introduce a little bit about myself. My name is Erica Iacona. For those of you who don't know me already, I've been working as an ecologist for nine years throughout Northern California, and I've intermittently performed a variety of bird work, as you can see here on the slide. In 2015, I began banding Sawa owls with the Altacal Audubon Society at the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. At that time, Dawn Garcia, for those who know her, she was leading the station and shortly thereafter, I began banding under Ken Sobon, who many of you probably know as the president of the Alta Cal Audubon Society currently, which is in Butte County. Oops, excuse me. Oh my gosh, sorry guys. Technical difficulties. <laughs> After a few fall seasons of banding Northern Solid Owls, I became subpermitted to band under Ken, under his master bander permit with the USGS. And I moved to Reading in 2017. And in 2020, I became a Wintu Audubon Society member and director at large. In 2022, in cooperation with the Wintu Audubon, I facilitated Shasta County's first Northern Sawa Owl monitoring station. And to bring it full circle, I just recently submitted my master bander permit application to USGS to become an authorized bander to, to band all non-listed owl species in the state of California. Moving on to sawwets. That's why we're here tonight. Sawwet owls are one of the smallest owls in the world. They weigh between 65 and 150 grams. And just to put that into perspective, that's only about like a half deck of playing cards, extremely small. Northern sawwet owls are considered the most plentiful owl in North America. And they're most closely related to the boreal owl, which they do overlap range, but boreal is more um, up in Canada and the North. Um, and they are the only two owls of their genus. In California, northern Sawa owls are known to breed throughout the Coast Range, the Cascade Range, and the Sierras. They prefer mature forests with an open understory for foraging, deciduous trees for nesting, and dense conifers for roosting. They are cavity nesters, but they are not known to roost in cavities. They like to roost around cavities in those taller, denser conifers hidden during the day. Sawwets are one of the few North American owl species that migrate seasonally. Like many songbirds, these owls are known to travel south in the fall and return to their breeding areas in the spring. However, this isn't true for all Northern Sawwet owls. They kind of go to the beat of their own drum and some remain in their breeding grounds year round and remain as a resident. Sawwets have fluffy feathered legs and four talons with one flexible talon joint that allows for prey and perch variability. These are their talons here in the upper left-hand corner. They're pretty adorable, honestly. <laughs> adorable, but sharp. They hunt almost entirely at night by waiting on low perches and then they swoop down on their prey. This is a really amazing picture that I um, found online. And it shows you just how powerful these guys are with their wings. And um, yeah, it's just pretty amazing. They eat mostly deer mice, shrews, bulls, young squirrels, small birds, large insects. And there are coastal populations that are known to eat intertidal invertebrates, which is really interesting. Um, the breeding occurs between March and July. So it's happening right now. And the males sing incessantly at night to defend their territory to attract a mate. And I just want to play for you really quick a male call. I need to make sure I'm sharing my sound. Okay. So this is what the males sound like. Hopefully you can all hear that. Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. 
They nest in previously excavated holes, usually carved by northern flickers or pileated woodpeckers, but they will also use nest boxes if available. Clutch sizes are typically around five to six eggs, and females will incubate their eggs for approximately one month. And then one month thereafter, she leaves. So it's pretty quick. These are juveniles in this photo down on the bottom right. They have a different plumage. They're pretty buffy, so adorable. The older Sawet siblings are known to assist in feeding their younger siblings once the mother leaves the nest, which is kind of an interesting fact. And I'm not sure that's seen in a lot of other species. And this is what the babies sound like. And there's been some uh, debate and different theories about how the Northern Sawa Owl got their name. A lot of people say that it has to do with their call sounding like a wet saw. Some people say that the juvenile call sounds like a wet saw and that's how they got it. Nobody knows for sure why exactly they've been deemed the Northern Sawwood Owl. Sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism means you can tell males and females apart by a physical difference in their traits. As with many owl species, sexual dimorphism in Sawwets is a difference in size rather than in their plumage. Uh, females are known to be larger than the males. And this is also known as reverse dimorphism. Males can Females can be up to about 50% larger than males, which is a significant, significant amount um, when you're thinking about the size of these creatures. Males are really small and really light. I just wanted to briefly go over the threats that they're facing. Um, Partners in Flight estimates a global breeding population of approximately 2 million. Sawwets experience a range of disturbance factors, and this is largely to do because they have such a broad geographic range. They occur in many places and in a variety of habitats. This species is climate vulnerable. I'm just gonna admit this person, sorry. They are climate vulnerable, and the above mapping depicts Sawwet habitat availability if our current temperatures were to increase by one and a half degrees Celsius and three degrees Celsius. So on the left, we have one degree Celsius increase. And this map is depicting that the owls will lose approximately 9% of their range if that increase were to occur. On the right, we have the range, which is um, approximately a loss of 21% of their current uh, range, anticipated to be lost with a increase of three degrees Celsius, which that is pretty significant. Now, of course, that's if the current range were to just stay completely the same, if there were no other alterations to their habitat. But we must consider that the loss of habitat due to development, deforestation, and particularly on the West Coast due to habit lo habitat loss due to wildfires. As with most birds, they are direct risk to extreme weather patterns. Nest failure may occur due to extreme heat and cold, and severe storms impact migrating owls, which we'll hear a bit more about in another slide. Some backyard conservation that most people can engage in if you have habitat nearby that would be suitable for northern Sawa owls. People can maintain the suitability of forest habitat by allowing dead trees to remain standing, which may provide nest cavities. And a snag as pictured here in the center, that's kind of what it looks like. I've actually personally seen owls nesting in a tree that looks just like this. Um, and I understand that this is a complex subject matter because um, of our wildfires in our area. And a lot of times this is considered fuel and not exactly um, valuable habitat components. Um, Sawwets also take readily to nest boxes, which can be used to mitigate the loss of natural sites. So here is actually Ken Sobon at the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve, and he is setting up nest box number five. He has several on the reserve, and to this day, I think they've been up several years. They haven't had a Sawwet utilize the nests yet, but there's still hope. Moving on to the recognition of northern Sawwet owl migration, which is an interesting topic. Because they are so highly nocturnal and rarely vocalize outside of their breeding season, 
Solid migration has been overlooked for many, many centuries. It's only recently that we've really acknowledged that these creatures travel long distances and they're long distance migrants. As the story is told, in the early 1900s, a steamboat captain witnessed a fallout of sawets after a bad storm forced the migrants to the water. So that kind of ties in that extreme weather pattern situation where we can, they can temporarily be at risk or be impacted severely when there's a large influx of migration and if there is severe weather pattern happens at the same time. To follow this, in the 1960s, two ornithologists in Wisconsin showed that predictable numbers of Sawa owls could be netted at night, even though the species was never detected there during the day and vocalizations were never heard. They were just so elusive that nobody ever really realized that they were moving around. Sawets now, today, are the most regularly banded owls on the continent, now that we know that they move and that they're they're moving low among their habitat, and so it's easy to draw them in using an audio lure. Over the last 29 years, Sawet migratory ecology has been studied intensively due to the efforts of Project Owlnet cooperators. Project Owlnet was established in Maryland in 1994. Owlnet facil excuse me, facilitates communication, cooperation, and innovation among Sawet researchers and they're really providing the standardized uh, methodologies for forest owl research. Today, there are approximately 200 stations, and that occurs throughout the North America. Six occur on the west coast of the United States, and now, today, after our station was added, four occur in California, which truly is not a whole lot. Despite the growing traction of our research efforts, little information is still known about their migratory patterns and overwintering preferences, particularly in the Western United States. And this was really the spark to create a Shasta County banding station. Moving on to Shasta County banding. So 2022 was the first year of solid monitoring in Shasta County. With received enthusiasm from the National Park Service, the monitoring station was situated within the northwestern corner of Lassen National Park, as this map depicts. You can see the green arrow is pointing in the general area of where our station sits in the park. The 2022 season was largely considered a pilot season, and this was really necessary to get a sense of the saw wet demographics for this area of the Cascade Range. Um, there were some questions about, well, do we feel like they're migrating through this area? Do we think that we're just gonna be getting residents? And this season really kind of answered some questions about that. So we were trying to see if we were capturing the same owls throughout the season or if different owls or different owls. So this provides the insight into the local demographic of the species. If different owls were captured all season long, then we can hypothesize that these individuals may, may be migrants. If we captured the same owls all season long, we can hypothesize that these individuals may be residents. And the only goal of 2022 was very simple, and that was to band as many owls as we possibly could. This is an aerial image of the area of Lashen National Park, which is where the banding station is and that yellow arrow is the approximate location of where our processing station is. And that blue line is the approximate area of where our net arrays are. So it's a short walk between the nets and the processing station. This study area was chosen not only for ease of access, but also for its mid serial mixed conifer stands, appropriate migrant habitat, and level terrain, which is uh, for ease of access of setting up our mist nets. The station elevation sits about 5,800 feet, and other active monitoring stations throughout California occur in Butte County, Humboldt County, and Contra Costa County. The Butte County Monitoring Station at Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve, which is in Forest Ranch, California, that is the closest monitoring station with a linear distance of approximately 49 miles. It is mining Ken's hope Ken is the one who, ran, who runs that Pew County station, that we will capture owls from each other's station since as the bird flies, it's relatively straight line between the two. So we'll, in, in more years to come, we're hoping for that. 
some methods and procedures to banning northern soa elves. As bird banders, the most important thing to us is the bird's safety. We do absolutely everything we can to minimize any stress or harm to the birds. And one facet of this is to reduce the amount of time that we have the birds from the time that they hit the net and they are captured to the time that we release them. Our monitoring station procedures follow the Project OwlNet standardized protocols, which I mentioned earlier, for phenology, net size, the net arrays, net sighting, audio lures, net checks, weather, aging, and sexing classifications. The weather forecast was monitored prior to every single banding event, and in the event that any likelihood of precipitation, the event was canceled. A total of three missed nets were used, including two, two 12 meter missed nets and one 18 meter missed net. The nets were placed in a T formation, and the speaker is placed at the center of the nets. The speaker is set to play that northern Sawa owl call that I played earlier, the male territory call, and it's on a repeating loop for at least four hours. The nets are open 30 minutes after sunset, and they stay open for four hours thereafter at minimum. Um, that's just the minimum. You can stay open all night long, and some stations do do that. There are stations in Washington, and there are stations out east that just have I don't know, hundreds of volunteers that can stay up all night long and they're banding thousands of owls a night. It's pretty amazing. Just a little bit about mist nets for those who are unfamiliar. Um, mist netting is only one technique for capturing birds. There are a couple, I won't get into those this evening. However, um, the mist nets that we use, they're typically made of nylon or polyester and they are suspended between two poles, picture a volleyball. Um, net. When properly deployed, the nets are virtually invisible, which is pretty cool. They have a loose baggy pocket, and when the bird hits the net, it falls into the pocket where it becomes cradled. And the purchase of mist nets does require a permit, so not just anyone can go out and buy, buy nets and um, net birds. But in the picture above, you can see this is a photo of a mist net, not one of mine. Um, but you can see the baffles. This gives a good depiction of what the baffles look like in between the tremor lines. And those are where the birds are getting cradled. And to the right, that is a northern sawwet owl hanging out in the net waiting to be processed. So for data collection, <clears throat> we have three main priorities when we're banning sawwet owls. We want to band them first and foremost. We want to age them and we want to sex them. Each owl gets banded with a uniquely numbered USGS leg band. And then we age. Age's determination of Sawa owls is based on the molt pattern among the primary and secondary flight feathers. And this is actually more easily viewed under UV light, as you can see here in this center photograph. We're using UV light to age, <clears throat> excuse me, to age the owl, showing because it more clearly shows the variation in their flight feather pattern. So what is causing this under the UV light? Um, UV light reveals fluorescing porphyrins in each flight feather, and these porphyrins fade as they're exposed to the sun. So newer molted flight feathers, we're gonna have brighter, more like more porphyrins within the feather. So they'll be brighter under the UV light. And the ones that have been exposed longer to the sun, those will have less. So you can see in the photo, there's some lighter, almost white feathers compared to the really pink vibrant feathers. We also take note of their body fat, their body molt, tail bars, tail length, any unique attributes that we notice. This year we had a few buffier looking owls and that could, that could mean that maybe they had just like freshly hatched that year and um, hadn't completely lost um, all of their juvenile plumage or it could just be a variation in their plumage. Either way, it's really cool and we, we kind of like to note that. Um, and we also note the presence of parasites. Aging Sawa owls. So Sawats have 10 primary and 13 secondary flight feathers. So just to get in really quick about flight feathers, the primaries are on the outer edge. I wish I had a pointer. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow, but on the outer edge of this wing are the primary feathers and on the inner edge are the secondary feathers. 
By observing molt limits in the flight feathers, researchers can confidently age owls. And experienced researchers can recognize molt patterns for older birds. So those would be birds that are three years old or four years old or even older. For the purpose of our study, all sawwits with more complex molt patterns were classified as ha after hatch year birds, just to keep it simple. The capture of pre previously banded birds gives greater insight into the age of an owl. When stations capture banded birds, the data can be compared to when they were first captured and then when they were last captured. The oldest captured northern sawwit owl was nine and a half years old, which is exciting. And in captivity, they can live as long as 16 years old. They say in the natural world, um, without you know, captivity, they're, they're living to about seven years old. So the fact that we have one that was nine years old is, is extraordinary. And so this photo, what it's depicting is the fresh feathers on the outer edges. So you can see the F is pointing to the outer primaries and the outer secondaries. And those are fresh feathers molted molted out, and the innards are the older feathers, which were retained from their hatch year. This is a second year bird, otherwise known as an after hatch year bird. And this is a really good example of the hatch year versus the second year molt limits. So as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, the hatch year birds have uniform throughout. And in the bottom right here in the corner, you can see the fresh outer limits on the primaries and on the secondaries. And then those old feathers in the middle, they are not glowing with their poor friends very much. Um, and I just wanna really briefly touch on what a hatcher is. A hatcher bird is, um, if we if say we caught it in the fall, then it grew up over the summer leading up to that fall. So it was born in the spring, the spring, that we had captured. An after hatch year bird has now spent two summers and we are catching it in the fall after that and so on, just for clarity. Sexing birds. While wing cord length alone may be enough to identify some males and some females, females typically have longer wings than males. There are many that do overlap, which can cause some confusion but it can be further determined in combination with their weight. So we use a specialized ruler with a stopper at the end to measure the owl's wing, which you can see in the left, the left uh, photograph. And we take what is called a wing cord measurement, meaning that we measure the wing in its natural curved state. So wings typically have, a, I don't know if you can see my hand, but it's naturally curved and we want the curvature um, to give us the accurate representation of the wing cord. We weigh the bird in grams, as you can see on the right, they're in a little cup and his little feet are sticking out. Um, and although it looks kind of silly, they are actually relaxed when we do this. It's not, it's not torture, I promise. <laughs> and after all of our data collected, the bird is released. And when we're working efficiently, we can um, extract and make it up to the processing station and get all of our data within like a minute and a half. We can do it really fast. And I just wanted to play a short clip of an owl being released from our banding efforts this fall. I always get a kick out of that. All right, so now diving into our results from 2022. Our banding began on September 24th and we commenced banding on October 29th. Snow accumulations in the park prevented us to, from banding well into November, but many stations do. A total of 13 Sawa owls were captured and banded in seven total nights of our monitoring efforts. On October 7th, there were no owls captured. One repeat capture and after hatcher Hatch year female was captured twice, first on September 30th, and then again on October 6th. So she was hanging around, probably foraging before moving on, or maybe not, we don't know yet. Maybe she hangs out in the area. 
Of the 13 owls captured, five were hatch year and eight were after hatch year. And you can see that in this graph depicted here, the hatch year birds are in blue and the after hatch year birds are in orange. So there was quite a bit more of after hatch year birds captured. The largest number of captured owls in one night was three, which occurred twice on October 1st and October 29th. These peak capture events are on trend with other results from other mon California monitoring stations. Some owls did possess more complex flight feather molt patterns, indicating adults over two years of age. But like I said before, for, this, for the purpose of our study, we're only classifying after hunt year. Females were more predominant than males with seven females, four of undetermined sex and two males, which is not totally uncommon. Um, many banding stations find that they are capturing a significant amount more of females than they are males. And this is because the males are known to stay on their nesting territory and females are moving around a little bit more. Research has shown that owl activity directly correlates with the phases of the moon. It was a full moon on October 7th, and if you recall, we did not catch any owls that evening. And although, so, although sawwets were detected audibly, there were no captures. And this was on trend with other California monitoring stations. I think all three didn't get any owls this evening. And um, what research has shown to support this. Um, higher ambient light levels are believed to make small owls more vulnerable to larger predators. And a corresponding drop in activity level has been observed to support this hypothesis. This is actually a photo of the moon that we captured that night um, through Larry's scope on an iPhone, which it's pretty amazing. We got a great view of the stars and the moon, but no owls, sadly. And the table here on the right, this is our 2022 measures of effort. These numbers are what we use to compare with other stations throughout the country. There are like small um, data collections and numbers that people are taking that don't always correlate. Not everybody is using the same methods and procedures. And so for our data to be comparable, we have to use things like um, measure of effort, and owl captures per 100 net hours. So it makes it really easy to compare to stations throughout our country. All in all, we had a very successful season despite the slower migration year and infrequent amount of banding events here in Shasta County. I only went out seven times. I'm hoping for more next year. Other species that we detected audibly and visually include barn owl and great horned owl. We also had an incidental capture of a northern flying squirrel, which was safely extracted and released. While none of our owls were captured at other stations, few previously banded owls were captured in Contra Costa County. So one of the owls from Butte County and one of the owls from Humboldt County were both captured in the Bay Area, which is pretty cool. We're starting to connect dots. This is very exciting for us. The more owls that we band, the more we can begin to connect those dots and about the movement here in California and on the West Coast. The goal next year remains to capture as many owls as possible throughout the fall migration season. I would also really love to find a station that's a little bit lower in elevation, um, which would make it easier to implement spring monitoring and um, fall monitoring throughout the November month. Last year, we did not encourage member involvement, but we are hoping to change that this fall. So be on the lookout, members of Wintu Audubon, for those announcements. I also just wanted to touch briefly on citizen science. Citizen science is the practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge throughout a community, or in this case, even broader, even broader continent-wide. Through citizen science, community members share and contribute to data monitoring and collection programs. So how is citizen science um, relevant to SAWETS? Project OwlNet really sparked that continent-wide citizen engagement to increase scientific knowledge of SAWET owls. We are performing the citizen science here in Shasta County. Funding for this research isn't widely available for species like the SAWET owl who have a relatively stable population, and who are not formally listed as endangered or threatened. 
But that doesn't mean that it's not important to monitor these populations and demographic trends to be stable. Birds are a good indicator of the health of the environment and the status and trends of bird populations are critical to identifying and understanding many ecological issues in developing effective science management and conservation practices. So we're really doing the groundwork. And I also wanted to put in a plug to report banded birds that you see, um, dead or alive. If you see it, report it to this website here. This is the USGS bird banding website. Um, you will need the band numbers and you will need the location in which the bird was encountered or harvested. And I also just wanted to thank a moment, uh, to take a moment to thank the Wintu Audubon members and the donors. Your contribu contributions, citizen, um, excuse me, with your contributions, citizen science programs like this exist and are possible. Um, I encourage those who are not already involved in their local Audubon to become involved. If you're in Shasta County, come be involved. Win2 Audubon hosts a slew of fun bird outings, um, participate in education and outreach events, and have several other very cool citizen science programs going on throughout our community. This is one of several. And that's the end of my slideshow. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Great presentation, uh, Erica. Um, Thanks, Larry. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions on the chat. You have Is your chat one? chat open. Yeah, let me get that open really quick. Thank you, Erica. No problem. Thank you. Yes, saw what owls can you use nest boxes? Hopefully I answered that question in the presentation. You For did. anybody who, who is interested in that, um, with any nest box, it's not just saw what owls, but with any nest box that you plan to build or buy, they do have to be specific sizes. So um, consult Google for that information. And uh, yeah, that'd be cool. Specific sizes and specific, specific entrance hole sizes. Yeah, exactly. I feel like- uh, kind of And I have a, I have a um, spreadsheet for that. Uh, that uh, anybody can get from me if you email me at webmaster at That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm keep going through here. Diameter of the nest box entrance, consult Larry. <laughs> <laughs> How often do the birds have parasites? I would say, I think I caught two this season. So two out of 13 had H flies, which is a parasitic fly. Um, and they're just nasty little things. Anytime we get, anytime we see them, we pull them off and um, make sure we wash those bird bags a little extra. Yes, with, okay, so let me read this one out loud. With avian flu so prevalent, is there worry about possible cross-contamination from bird to bird? So yes, I have thought about this and we implement measures to minimize the cross-contamination. Um, we have an abundance of bird bags, so we never put a bird in the same bird bag that's already been used. After it's been used, it goes into another bag that I take home and I wash. Um, and then we also wipe down all of our equipment. So our, um, what's the, the wing cord measuring ruler and um, the cup and that kind of a thing. We sanitize everything. Was the, fir was the squirrel found here in Lassen? Yes, the squirrel was captured in Lassen National Park. It was a Northern flying squirrel. Um, keep going down. Thank you everybody for all the support. I think that's it. Does anyone else have a have a question? You're welcome to open it up and you don't have to do it in the chat. Yes, Erica? Yes. My name is Kai Kong. Hi. A few years ago, I was in Brown County in Southern Indiana and Purdue University had a uh, I guess it was a, a, a birding event 
and I was able to participate in the harvesting of the insects oh, about wow. midnight. <laughs> and, nice. And the reason for that was to determine what type of insects was active so at that particular time for the avians to harvest it was such interesting in it was purdue university that is very interesting and what a fun thing to be a part of oh that was so much fun <laughs> oh i i totally got lost in it <laughs> there there are some owls who like explicitly forage on insects. For example, the flammulated owl is a, a big candidate for that. Um, and we have experiences up here of folks that I know who were out, I don't know, fishing at night or something. There was something to do with a lantern. They had a lantern on that was attracting mm -hmm. moths and they had flammulated owls coming right in front of their face to pick up the moths that were coming, that were wow. being attracted to the light. That's so, correct. Yeah, so really cool a stuff. Yes, Erica, so we took account of the various moss and insects that we collected on a white uh, mesh yep. that they set up like your net. Yep. And, and my final question is, will you have some activity set up where you need volunteers to help you do that exactly process? We will not be studying any insects or looking at any insects, um, but we will be taking volunteers, those who are interested um, to either come up one time. I don't know where you live, but if you live in Shasta Redding. County, do you live in Reading? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so we will be putting a note out there to Wintu Audubon members for volunteer nights to come up and help band at the station. So you are more than welcome to come do that. And yes, experience that would it. be great too. So, Excellent. where are you? I'm in Reading. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> I would love. I would enjoy helping. Absolutely, you're more than Thank welcome. You. No problem. Thanks for coming. So, speaking of that, anybody uh, who wants to be added on to our email list, um, email me your email at webmaster at wintuautobahn.org. And I'll put you on our mailing list. Um, we do have a um, birding event coming up Saturday morning at 7.30 at the Clear Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, there should be a lot of uh, warblers coming through and there have been some really good birds there uh, being posted. So uh, check on our uh, website because we post everything um, on our website for our events. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Oh, there says there's five new messages on here. I didn't see that. Oh, let me check. Oh, just everybody just, telling you how great your presentation was. Yes, that's awesome. I'm so glad everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> hey, Eric, I have a question. This is Jackie. Um, hey. What is the, the, what are the predators for the sawwit owl? That is a great question. I'm so glad you asked because I didn't include it. Um, so the predators are many of the owls that we experienced this fall while we were there. Barn mm -hmm. owls, uh, great horned owls, um, northern spotted owl, spotted owls, and um, newly influx into California is the barred owl. Mm -hmm. So a lot of larger predators, um, owls eat owls, it's a sad thing, but it happens. <laughs> and um, I will say it'll be interesting moving forward. I don't think that anybody is looking at the data quite yet, but we already have a healthy population of large owls in California. And with this influx of barred owls coming in at a rapid rate, it will be interesting to see how this um, interacts with the small owl population. So I'm excited to look at the data moving forward with that, even though it means that many of our beloved Northern Sawa owls might be barred owl food. Erica, is this, yes. is this owl a, a threatened species? It is not a threatened species. I'm hearing echoing. Thank you. Erica, Sorry, I'm just going to mute people. I have a question or comment. 
Hold on, Catherine. Okay. I'm getting feedback from somewhere. I'm going to mute everybody. All right, Catherine, unmute yourself again. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was really interested in the fact that some of the owls like stay and are, are you know, live there and others migrate. Can you say more about that? That was so interesting to me. Yes, I, I wish that I had more information on why they do that. Um, what we do know is for the males, they stay on territory. That's a very, um, that's like a normal trait about soa owls. What we don't know is why they migrate um, because in the areas that they're migrating to and from, many times the climates aren't that much in fluctuation. So they could in theory stay on, stay on breeding grounds and forage throughout the year just fine. Why move? We don't have the answers to this yet. <laughs> so I can't really answer that question. Um, I think that many times it has to do with prey abundance in a specific area. Um, I think that the birds are in tune with things that we des don't necessarily perceive in our human, you know, living ecology. So like they're perceiving, oh, this weather caused this prey abundance to be a certain way this year. Maybe it's a really high prey year and they can just stay where they are. Other mm -hmm. times, if the prey is down for one reason or another, maybe there was a ton of wildfires like there had been here in California and that helped or didn't help them kind of a thing. So I think it just it depends on what's going on around them. Okay. That's my, my best assumption. <laughs> And are some of them like permanent residents or are they like all migrating? Some just stay a little longer, maybe several years even, but are, are some like permanent residents? Yes, some are permanent okay. residents. And the there is males. Yes, um, okay. but there is actually a known population on an island off of the coast of British Columbia and they have um, year-round resident owl population, northern spotted, or excuse me, northern Sawa owl population. Um, and that's where that data came from actually about the intertidal invertebrates and them mm -hmm. um, feeding on intertidal invertebrates was that island and that study. So mm -hmm. they do have areas where they're just hanging out year-round and happy and have mm -hmm. a prey abundance that's great year-round. So okay. yeah, we just don't have enough answers yet. And even in 30 years of banding, we don't have a lot of uh, questions answered, oddly enough. <laughs> Thank you. Great answer. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have any more questions? Oh, you're on mute. Someone was talking, but. 